Um, this mimer is the, the perhaps the most important mimer of all the mimer that Rebbe had said since he became our Rebbe. Um, we're ready. We're ready. Yeah. Just trying to set up Whatever actually said this mimer in 1981, 39 years ago. Uh, 11 years later, on Purim Cotton, that year we had two Adars. So the first Purim, Purim Cotton, it's called, the Rebbe gave us, this is not Tafshin Nun Bay, the last, right before the stroke. This was a week. Um, a little over a week before the stroke, the Rebbe gave us the minor of the Atta Tetzave, which quite clearly indicates what we have to live with today. As you say, the Rebbe gave us food for the journey, long, arduous journey that we are suffering without seeing him for the last uh, 25 years, I can't believe it, 26 years. Um, where we have been deprived of being able to see our Rebbe physically. Well, many of us have witnessed and experienced miracles even more than before Gibel Tammuz. Um, there's no air conditioning here? Yeah. Wait, wait, cold, but then everyone. Yeah, cold? Huh? Is it, it's too cold? No, no, it's not. Okay. So this mimer really is, is a mimer that encapsulates what a Rebbe is, what faith is all about, what a moon is all about. Many of you, or some of you, all of you, have probably learned this mimer. Uh, it's a well-known mimer, but you can learn it again and again and again, and it's never enough. So I'll, I apologize if you're expecting something that you've never learned before, to read your mind, but I have to choose this mimer because it's a mimer that every time you learn and every time I learn, I see new things that I didn't, I didn't pick up the first time. Um, again, it's about what a Rebbe is all about, what every Rebbe has in common, and what, how they differ depending on the generation. What is faith? What does it mean to believe? What is belief based on? Believing in what? What are we believing in? Believing that there's a God? For that, for most people who have an element of common sense and are able to think straight, you don't need to have belief to believe that there's a God. More than 90% of humanity believes in a God. Um, the truth is, that even in believing in a God, there's a difference between if you just view it logically, like the world abroad, a non-Jew can also, many non-Jews, most of the non-Jewish world believes in God, versus the Jewish belief. I'm talking about even when we discuss uh, the very belief that God is, is the creator, and nothing more than that. The non-Jewish approach is, it makes logical sense. So his belief is based on logic. A Jew doesn't need to calculate how did the world get here. Things don't create themselves. You see a book, what are the odds and the chances that this book wrote itself? Ink spilled and wrote a book. That's a lot less ludicrous and absurd than believing that the world created itself. That logic is very forceful, which is why most of the most of humanity believes in a god. Off the subject, what leads them to believe that perhaps there is no god is what happens: tragedies that happen, things that make no sense. Where was God? Why did this happen? Also, to believe in a in a, in a being that you can't fathom, it's hard, especially for a scientist to want to accept. But if you think straight, you really think logically it makes no sense, it makes very little, it just makes it completely absurd to believe that we, we're a bunch of accidents. 
it's also hard to live a life like that there that we're just an accident and there's no questions why anymore what kind of life is that i never was able to fathom how an atheist lives his life or her life <laughs> going to bed getting up in the morning and everything is just by there's no no controller i just can't imagine living a life like that besides the absurdity of it it just doesn't emotionally just makes makes no sense. Um, you know, when you take a trip, to be married soon, and your spouse hasn't seen you for a while, you're gonna get a call. Are you okay? How's everything? I was waiting for your call. Someone cares about you. Can you imagine if there's nobody that takes any account for your existence? And whatever you do is just random. But that's not why a Jew believes in God, believe, believe it or not. Believe it or not. No pun intended. A Jew does not believe in God because it makes logical sense. He believes in God because he feels something. He or she feels something. You don't need the logic. But in addition, in addition to that, miracles. When miracles happen, non-Jews will only believe in a miracle if they witnessed it. And very often, even when they witness it, will try to calculate how it's perhaps not a miracle even the splitting of the Red Sea. A Jew does not need to hear, to have, you know, does not need to see the actual miracle to believe that it, that it happened. Because a Jew, the source of a Jewish soul originates from the level of godliness that transcends the world, from God's thought, not God's speech. And therefore, the rules of nature in other words, the Jew is not limited to nature. As we all know, our whole existence is not natural. We're connected to that element of godliness that transcends nature, and therefore it's very easy to accept a miracle. Why not? A non-Jew has to have, really? That's so hard. And they marvel when they see miracles. Um, then it goes even further than that. One thing that a non-Jew can't relate to talking about the creation of the world. This is not related, not related to the mind exactly, but I wanted to focus on what exactly are we talking about when we discuss that a Rebbe is the one who feeds us with faith. What is faith, first of all? So I'm giving you like a little hakdama, a little introduction that's not mentioned. By the way, I have the book here in English. It gives his own hakdama, his own introduction that I'm not mentioning. I'm just gonna, he gives a whole overview of the whole mind I'll do a little bit of that too, but I want to just Mention one more or two more things about belief, about faith, where we differ from the non-Jewish world. Um, God creates the world. Does he get affected by creation? Is he, is there a mutual in, you know, influence? God created the world. And when he did so, he vested some energy into that creation. Like when you do something, you're preoccupied. Was God preoccupied when he created the world? Is it like a soul in a body? When your soul comes into your body, it vivifies, gives life to the body. Body is dead, meat without the neshama. But when the, the difference is when the neshama comes into the body, the soul is affected by the body too. whether it's the animal soul or the godly soul, it's affected by the body is not healthy. The animal soul can't express itself properly. Likewise, in the spiritual sense, if a person is spiritually unhealthy, it affects the godly soul as well. So the godly soul, while it's giving, is a give and take. It's like a teacher and a student. When the teacher gives to a student, he's preoccupied. You can't just sit back and ideas just emerge from you. It doesn't have work that way. It's not like the sun shining. You have to give of yourself. So there's the student is affected by the teacher and the teacher is affected by the student. Because teaching takes a lot of energy out of you. Not only that, the student can impact the teacher's level of intelligence by asking good questions. And to bring things down to the level of a student takes a lot of things. First of all, you have to explain it clearly and that's not easy you have to think deeper. Then when the question is asked, oh, he threw me off guard, well, uh, that gets me to think even deeper. So it's, an inter it's a, it's a two-way street of, you know, where each one affects the other. See that 
you have a healthy eye, you'll be able to see, but the power of sight will, will, will express itself better. Uh, all the different parts of the body, it's that way, but not that way with God. He gives and he's completely unaffected by what he does. In other words, there's no change in him whatsoever before creation, during creation. Can't say after creation because it's continuously being created. So before and during, nothing has changed whatsoever. Everything has changed as far as we're concerned. We're here now. We weren't here before. Now we're here. We're being recreated. Incredible. Yes, may I am. And yet, that power that creates us is completely unchanged. I non Jews have a hard time believing in that. They don't really believe in the yesh mi'ayin, the way we do, by the way. Total, absolute, ex nihilo, what they would call nothingness would be nothing that we can visibly see with our eyes. Um, but they do believe that there was a potential for existence before the world existed. God activated that potential. We say there was no potential. God created the potential. There was no potential for existence. That itself was a creation. What? Can't picture that. They learn, they understand that God is the cause, the, cert, the first cause of creation. God didn't, is not the first cause. God forbid to say that. You're lowering him by saying he is defined as a cause. He created the cause. What he is, can't even talk about. They don't have that kind of grasp, that refined type of grasp. Um, so this is what we're talking about in Amuna. Furthermore, here's even a bigger Kiddush. It's even more novel than to say that God is not affected, not preoccupied in what he's doing when he creates the world. Guess what? Okay, I'll accept that. But at least there's one difference. First it was God and only God. Now there's God and us, right? Wrong. What? We're not here? No, but we don't take his oneness, his one and onlyness hasn't changed. That's really hard to fathom. A lot harder than to fathom that he doesn't get affected. He's completely... Uh, invulnerable and pervious to any kind of uh, effect. While he's affecting so much in us, nothing has changed in him. But to say that there's no change in his oneness and his unity, we're here now. We weren't here before. Now we're here. Ready to borrow a kid. Try that to an Anju. It won't work. Maybe before Mashiach comes, we'll have that refined ability to understand things that we always, we always didn't even need to understand it. We just accepted it. Why do Jews accept these things? What makes us, if it doesn't make sense and it's not possible to, you know, to explain it, I'll be logic, then how is it that we accept it so easily? Where is that coming from? Is it blind, God forbid, blind faith? Where is that coming from? So the mind is going to explain two different levels, which we'll see later, Yechaya and Yechida, and then we'll discuss two different levels in Yechida, which is the highlight of this mimer. And this is when we get to the second level of Yechida, you'll see clearly what the devil wants from us today. Okay. The key, the key is that the emuna should not be in the abstract. We all have that, and at times it'll hit us, but it'll come and go, and we'll just lose that experience. Coming from the mazel of our neshama, the mazel, the madrega of chaya, it's um, not within our body. It's the part of the soul that didn't come into the body, but it's hanging over us. And it every now and then throws us sudden thoughts of fear. You don't know why you're afraid. Sudden feelings, I better change my life. Or sudden feelings of love of God. Where, how, how did I get that? Where did that come from? It's coming from your neshama that sees and hears God on a regular it sees, it can visualize a lakus. It doesn't have to have testimony, it sees God close range. And that part of the soul is connected to the soul in the body. And when you shake the rope on top, the rope on the bottom starts to shake and we get all, we don't know why, but we're getting nervous. We're getting either nervous, scared, or ah, good feeling of love. Also, the, the Shabbos report Tisha B'Av, Shabbos Chazon, where we have a vision of the third base of you ever see it? But the fact that we can feel, yeah, it's real, just like, when you see something, seeing is believing. So we don't have a sight, but the belief is there. The belief that is created through the power of sight remains with us without even actually seeing it ourselves. Something in us is seeing and we believe. But that's not why a Jew really believes. 
It's much deeper than that. That's Chaya. Then comes Yechida. So this we'll see later on in the Mimer that there's a, and this is the real function of a Rebbe is to pump Yechida into us. In other words, the word Raya Mehem, they've heard the word Raya Mehem, the faithful shepherd. Simple shot means that he's a shepherd. A Rebbe is a shepherd. He cares for every single sheep. Like if a shepherd cares for his flock, he understands and needs the best place where this sheep could eat grass, best grazing place for this type of sheep, here. And for the one who could take more grass, puts them over here. A Rebbe is not just one who has the overall picture, I'm the leader of Kali Yisrael, but he's a leader of every Jew individually and feels a connection to every single Jew like it's the only Jew in the world. Knows you better than you know yourself. Um, so he's a faithful shepherd, and you can trust when he says something, you can trust that he's not making up stories. But the deeper shot is he's not only a faithful shepherd, he's a shepherd of faith. And I will humbly say that something tells me that these two translations, the simple one or the homiletical one, the simple one means he's a faithful shepherd or a shepherd of faith. Perhaps we can say like this, he's a shepherd of faith, of course, in God, but also give a, he feeds us with faith that he is the faithful shepherd. The Rebbe feeds us, the leader of the generation feeds us with faith, including besides the faith in God, the faith in him, in that we should trust that what he says is real. The Rebbe says a, a prophecy, this and this will happen. Or if the Rebbe said the scud missiles, well, there will be no gas, uh, nothing will be, uh, won't need any gas masks during the Gulf War or before the Six Day War, don't worry, there'll be miracles. I was al alive and well before the Six Day War. None of you, I don't think anyone here, no, nobody here is near that. But I remember it so clearly, eight days before the Six Day War, the Rebbe spoke, and you've probably seen it, eight days before the Six Day War. This was in the end of May. War broke out in the first week of June. Lag Boimer prayed for the kids. The whole world was expecting a Holocaust. The question is, will it be 100,000 losses or a million losses? Or who knows what? Preparing graves. And the Rebbe spoke, King came out and spoke, gave us such chizuk that even those that were sort of anti Lubavitch heard the recording, the tape on the tape, you know, I mean, those days there was no, uh, <laughs> the old fashioned tape recorder. So they heard it and they said, wow, he has comforted, he has comforted us. People scared stiff, they were predicting doom and gloom. The Rebbe was the only voice that predicted miracles will happen. And it was hard to believe because we were surrounded by all the, uh, you know, now it's a little easier because we've had that miracle. During the Gulf War, or when there was a hurricane in the, in the 90s, after the stroke, you had to trust that the Rebbe shakes his head, yes, stay where you are, don't be afraid. You're trusting, putting your trust in your life. They were saying, evacuate. And what, this is during the uh, famous hurricane, I forget the name of the, what was the name of the hurricane, uh, whatever, I forgot the name, huh? No, oh, no, Andrew, whatever, who cares? Yeah, names are hard to not important. I don't feel bad, I forgot the name. Yes, you know the name? No, <laughs> Okay. But anyways, people living there were, your faith was trust. The Rebbe says, even though he had a stroke and he's only shaking with his head, he's not speaking. Trust, put your trust in him. And the Rebbe feeds us, I believe, with the trust and faith that you can trust him. Mashiach. Does it look like he's coming? Stay in. One day goes by, another day goes by, another day goes by. Darkness, the darkness is getting darker and darker and darker. The world is going crazy. Anarchy looks dangerous. Where is Mashiach? Unless the person says it has to come. Because look at the, the world can't exist anymore the way it is. But that's not. Do you see Mashiach in the making? You see it's very difficult. Another aspect of faith that the Rebbe is pumping into us constantly. The ability to believe in God, of course, and what we just mentioned before, in him and, and in the fact that one of the most important principles of faith is the belief in Mashiach, Mashiach now, and that it's imminent. In spite of the fact that so many days go by, as time goes by, time is not on that side. Now, I'll share with you one interesting thing. It says, this will be the last thing I'll talk about, we'll start to mind um, it says before Mashiach comes, there's going to be a, a, a major, major test. 
There was a test. If you look into Malachim Kings, chapter 18, you know the famous story of the Leo, the Har Carmel, the Baal, there were the, uh, you know the story. You take your bull and I will take mine and when the fire comes down, that's the, that's the true God. Stop straddling on both sides. Either you believe in this or you believe in that. And thank God, Hashem made the miracle that the fire came down and uh, consumed everything, including, including the water, fire consuming water, and the sacrifice. And everyone screamed out, wow, Hashem will look him, Hashem will look him. The Rebbe of Abrengen mentioned that it's known from the non lubavitch sects that the form of Shield comes, there'll be this kind of test, but guess what? The fire will come, will descend on the wrong side. And it'll be a major test in your faith. How could this happen? And we're witnessing this a little bit. We witnessed it. I remember before Gimel Tamos, I was, we had to believe Mashiach was out, out, and people were against all odds, against nature, that the Rebbe will recover. And the fire fell on the other side. Although it's 26 years from then. But even now, we see things that are going on in the world which really puts our faith to test. It feels like the fire is on the wrong side. Because everything we believe in is not working. And this is to challenge our ability to overcome even a test like that. Because don't forget, this generation is the seventh generation. And the seventh generation is not only seven. Well, sevens are very sweet and dear. But seven, how do you spell seven? How do you say seven in Hebrew? Shvi. But you can also say Sivi, because we don't have any dots. The shin can turn into a sin. Sivi means satiated. That this generation has the most power and energy than all the generations put together. The last generation of Golos, as the Rebbe used to say, has more energy, more uh, fuel to overcome all kinds of trials and tribulations than any other generation in history. And in that, we are giants. We're not just midgets on top of giants, because we have so much great predecessors and we've learned from our past, but we are small people, maybe intellectually speaking, compared to the great tzaddikim of the, of the past generations. But when it comes to Mesiras Nefesh, which is a highlight of this mimer, self-sacrifice, this generation beats any generation in history. We are the giants in Mesiras Nefesh, nothing to be you know, down upon. We are great and powerful. Um, and this is also what the Rebbe is giving us in this mind may also uh, hints to that idea that we are giants in the sea of He doesn't say those exact words. Now the Rebbe refers to the previous Rebbe in this mimer, personally, that although he wasn't talking about himself, but whatever he said about Mordechai applies to himself. And then if that's the case, well then the Rebbe likewise is in, in, not named by men, he's not named in this mimer, but he's also there because whatever applies to the previous Rebbe applies to him even more than we see by the previous Rebbe. So we're going to start the mime. I know I wasted a lot of time, but I'd like to talk a lot. <laughs> Compared to the actual mime itself, as a waste. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, when the Rebbe says something, is it that he foresees what's going to happen in the future and then he's just revealing what that's going to happen? Or, or is he make it happen? Or yeah, is, or or is, is it he when both? the Rebbe says something and Hashem has to happen? You know the story of the. <laughs> You know what the, what the miracle of Majeski that happened? I'm sure you all know about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, the Rebbe did things, made things happen. Yeah. The Rebbe wasn't prophesying that it's going to happen. The Rebbe said, I preempted, because the crash was a crash that should not have had any, any survivors. And it was not one fatality, thank God. But Majeski was the only one missing, by the way. There were nine boys, and they only counted eight. But when he jumped out of the car, he went down all the way down the hill. And he came back, you know, shaken up. So he was a ninth person. And uh, not a scratch, by the way. And the driver put his hand in the fire. Unbelievable. And the Rebbe said, so the Rebbe spoke about, he probably heard this, not even just himself, the Rebbe actually told Rebbe Chadakov, who never gets excited about anything. His face was white. And he said, the Rebbe just said that the reason why he spoke about after a fire had come rich was he had you in mind. And this precluded, this preempted and stopped uh, and the was saying that this is what, why did you miraculously escape because of what I did before? Here's the Rebbe admitting that, his, that he made a miracle. So it's both true. It's, uh, you don't know which one is which, but at times the Rebbe is foreseeing and at times the Rebbe is making it happen. The stories that go on, I can go on with the stories each way, but I don't want to go into that right now. Because we'll 
Tavos Bar Tamayim. Okay. The Ath of the Tavos B'nai Yisrael Yichle Lech of Shem and Zayi is off. Here you have the postage you have in front of you. Um, so Shem translates, and you shall command the Jewish people. They shall take to you, for you, pure olive oil, crushed. Kosis means crushed. Lamar for the luminary. Lahalois ner to raise a constant flame. The anomalies, all the questions that we could ask on this Pusik are well known. Question number, there are going to be four questions over here. Okay, the four questions by the say we have four questions. Question one is divided into two. Question one is the Kohatsi Boyim Shibitaira in all the commandments of the Taira. It just says simply, Nemar, it says, Sabbath bin Israel. God speaks to Moshe saying, Command the Jewish people. Not you shall command, but without the word you. The Khan over here in our postic, for some odd reason, Namar, it's written, the Atta, and you shall command as B'nai Yisrael. Here the Rebbe adds a little fuel to the question. The further the question, it's not just a question of linguistic. The anomaly is not only a question of the style of what language to use, whether it's Sa or Atta, but it's like, it changes the whole meaning. That the question on the back that it says the art of the who lay rock the halloshin is not just a question of what phrase, what language to use, linguistic telegamba hatoshin, but also affects a change in the meaning. The lotion, the art of the tzave, when it says the art of the tzave, mashma, this implies Shemoshu who amitzave, that Moshe is not the transmitter of God's command, but he's the commander. And of course, that begs the question how can we say that? But sorry, well, we have to understand. Hare Moshe is nothing more than the Shaliyah. He's only an agent. Limser li Yisrael and Siva Kodesh Baruch to transmit to the Jewish people God's command. Why does it say be Atta and you shall command? Question number one is finished. Question number and this question will be answered immediately in the next paragraph. Unusually, so that's quite unusual where a mimer asks a question and then you hear not long after the answer. Usually it's at the end of the mimer, and sometimes you never see the answer. Question number two, we also have to understand what the Pasuk says, and they shall take to you, give you, the Jewish people should give you the oil. She bring the Shem and the oil to Moshe, to you. Why to Moshe? He's not the one who lights the candles. At first glance, it seems very puzzling. Since the lighting of the menorah, of the candles, was through Aaron, he's the one who kindles the menorah. If that's the case, then it could be given to him. Why was there a need? Why was it necessary to bring the oil to Moshe when he's not the one to light it? Question number three. This question is also answered pretty close in the next paragraph. Question three and four are not going to have answers that are and they're not going to be answered until in the middle or the end of the mind. Question three. We also have to understand. Pasuk says that the oil shall be Zayizah, because it's crushed. Lamar for the luminary. Now, that's strange. It should have said, because it's Lahoyer. The Lahoyer at first glance, Havale, the Maymar, Shemin, Lahoyer. It should have said oil to illuminate, to shine, to radiate, to light. Why oil for the luminary? Because the oil, the oil, the crushed oil has an impact on how much light there's going to be. But it doesn't change the menorah. Whether you use this kind of oil, that kind of oil, the luminary, the source of light is not affected by the oil. So why then say, causes crushed for the menorah, crushed for the lighting? It will affect how much light the menorah, what kind of light the menorah will give out. This is question number, number three. Question number four, and the final question, which is the end of this paragraph, is, we also have to understand, that there's a discrepancy. It says in the very first pasuk, the last word of the first pasuk is lahalois ner tamid, that it will raise up a constant flame. And it sounds like that the menorah, the lighting of the menorah will be constant, nonstop, not just at night, but during the day too, twenty-four seven. But in the next paragraph, in the next uh, pasuk, gamzark will help me. Also, have to understand that the pasuk in the pasuk following this pasuk, it doesn't say tamid. 
constant flame. Nemar mi erev ad boiker. It says only from the evening until the morning. The Khan over here, Nemar, it says, laha lois ner tamin, to raise up a constant flame. Is it constant or is it only at night? So of course, there are a lot of answers to this question without learning Hasidus. The simple answer is constantly, every single night, it should be lit. Constant does not have to mean day and night. It means nightly, every night of the year, regardless of what night it is. That's also called constant. But when do you light it? At night. Or you can say that it was actually one candle, one of the candles never went out, called the Nerham Aravi, the Western candle. The question is which one was the Western one. But it was a candle that miraculously lasted throughout the whole day. And they had to extinguish it and rekindle it again just to be Yoitse and other mitzvah. But it actually miraculously did not, it stayed lit the whole 24 hours. That's an, that's an answer according to you know, the Medrash. But then we have the Mimer's answer, which is much deeper. Okay. That's the end of the first paragraph. Now the second paragraph. The fire, and this Mimer you, have, you should know is based on the Mimer of the previous Rebbe, that's connected to Yudbe Samus, 1927, the year of his redemption, of his liberation. So the Rebbe Rebbe said a Mimer a few months before, and this Mimer led to his incarceration because he openly he spoke openly against, he knew right, right away that there are spies over there that are watching him. And he said, I'm not afraid of anything and I'm gonna speak openly. Uh, and it led to his arrest. So this mimer that the Rebbe, this our mimer of the Rebbe is based a lot on the previous Rebbe's mimer, which begins with the words of the Megillah, the Kibbal HaYehudin, the Jewish people received, accepted what they, what they took on upon themselves. So um, explains the whole my the holy father-in-law, my teacher, my father-in-law, Admur, which stands for the well-known mimer, Drush Hamaschel, the mimer that begins with the word the Kibel Hayahudin, Shinemar, the Purim Koton, that was said, Purim Koton, same holiday that ever gave out this mimer, but of course that was much more, many years later. But that was the mimer that the previous Rebbe said was said on Purim Kotam, which is the first Adar, Tuf Reish Pezayin, 1927. So the previous Rebbe in that mimer says the following. And this is the answer to our question, why does the Pasuk say over here, and you, Moshe, shall command when Moshe is not the commander? And the answer is, the word that Saba, besides meaning commander, also has another meaning, connector. Tzivoy, Tzaba, Hutzavsa V'chivoy. That the word sivoy, the word titzava, besides meaning a commandment, is also that which connects, that which binds and joins together and unifies the Jewish people amongst themselves, but especially amongst between them and God. And who is the one that does that? Who is the person that is able to connect every single Jew with God? And not just the godliness that's camouflaged in this world, but God himself the infinite aspects of God, or himself, who has that power? The Moshe of the generation. And you, Moshe, your job is Titzave. By giving over the commandment, you're also doing much more. You are connecting and binding and uniting all the Jewish people with God. That Moshe joins, knights the Jewish people with the infinite light of God. Or himself. What does Aryan self mean? There's two ways to explain what it means. It's a little off the subject, but it's good to know this. Ur, that is infinite, or uh, the light of the infinite one, or the light which is infinite. Is the infinite going a, a, an adjective on the light, or is it the source of the light? The light coming from that who is the one who is infinite. So God himself is infinite, gives off light, which is his own rays. So again, is the word Ain self Defining the light or defining the source of the light. And Chassidus, Rebbe Rashav, the fifth Rebbe, in his famous mimer, says that no, it's not referring to God. And it says, Aryan Sof, it's not referring to the light of the one who is Ain Sof. The light itself is infinite. God is more than infinite. God himself is not infinite. He is more than just that. He is also beginningless. He's not just endless. He's beginningless. So when it says Ur Ainsaf, it can't mean the Ur of the one who is Ainsaf because God is a lot more than Ainsaf. 
God creates, Hashem can create anything to have to be endless. But he shares with no one his exclusive power of being beginningless. There's nothing besides God that has no beginning. In fact, even Hashem's ear, Hashem's light, has a beginning. Where does light come from? The luminary. So as much as the light is infinite, it's not beginningless. It's endless. God can create endless entities, but they'll always have a beginning. The only one who has no beginning, which is hard to fathom, no beginning, no cause, he is an absolute existence that has to, has to exist. We also can't imagine that. Something that has to be. And he has to be more than two and two has to be five. God created that two and two has to be five. It's a created phenomenon, although we can't picture it otherwise. So that has to be is a lot less has to be than God's existence. And by the way, just by the way, the fact that God is the essence of God has no beginning is the reason why we're able to, when we feel that we didn't come from anywhere. How is it that God created us? Every single second our existence is really being recreated. And we start saying, and we could say, without using our brain, we don't feel, we feel as if we created, we were always here. We feel like there's no creator. But Siddhis says that the fact that we're able to mistakenly say to ourselves, we have, we begin, our beginning is from ourselves. There's no power that, that brought us into existence. It's because there is a true, a true existence that doesn't have a beginning. From the true non-beginning, we can have a fake non-beginning. The fact that we're able to fake ourselves and think that we have no beginning, we were always around is because we come from God who always was around. So in other words, what you see in the world, people saying there is no God, that's another proof of how, how great God is. Another proof, this leads us to see and feel the beginninglessness of Hashem. It's off the subject completely, but I just wanted to throw that in. Anyways, Urain self means the light that's infinite. God is a lot more than infinite. But infinite is also pretty powerful. Um, and Meshur Rabbeinu connects us with infinity. Okay, now, that's not where it ends. When Moshe does his job of connecting every single Jew to, Arian, to the Urain self, to the infinite aspect of God, Moshe himself is enhanced. The energy of Moshe is enhanced as well. So it's not just the tzaddik is always giving and giving and giving and we give nothing back. We give plenty back. And what exactly does he get back? We'll soon see. And through the fact that Moshe is mashbiya to us, to make kasher some im that he binds us, connects us, and unites us with the erin sov that we're able to feel and sense Without any proof that there's such a concept called Ein Sov, Al Yidei Zeh Nase Yisrael V'Hay Sov Abamayshe. Through that, there's a Yisrael, there's an enhancement and an added quality of energy and dimension in Moshe Rabbeinu's Neshama. Moshe grows. The other ones made it clear that they asked him, where do you get all the strength and power to do what you do? He goes, I get from the Chassidim. I told you the same story, I'll tell it again, for those who might have heard it. I was in Miami for three years. I know everyone probably did hear the story. So anyway, good to hear the story again. I was in Miami when I was a buffer still. I was a shliach of the Rebbe in 1974 to 1977 and 1976. Towards the end of our shlichus, uh, close to the end of our shlichus, we got a little you know, restless with a friend of mine and we decided we were going to try her. Because we heard a lady down the road as a, uh, a Jewish lady, an older lady. She's a graphologist, and she could uh, analyze your character through handwriting. We wanted to know, you know, if she's for real or just, uh, you know. So my friend and I decided we were going to test her. And we gave in our handwriting to her. And boy, was she accurate. It was scary. Once we decided, once we saw how accurate she was with our own handwriting, we just said, let's give her the Rebbe's signature. And those days, it was possible not to know who the Rebbe was. So we took the Rebbe's English signature, cut it out, and she received it. And she said, there's not time right now, she's busy. But uh, tomorrow, give her a, we should give her a call tomorrow morning to let you know when she can, uh, you know, take a look at it. So there was a phone call, a phone in the base of I've said the story a few times. A phone in the base of there in Miami, Florida. And it was 12 midnight. I was still learning. And um, it was 
David and Joseph. We could do. I'm, I'm Joseph, and my friend was named was David. David. Okay. Is David or Joseph there? Uh, uh, Joseph. And when Joseph, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm here. Who's this? I don't know. Someone's. I don't know who she is. Uh, I answer the phone. Is this Joseph? I said yes. Who is this man? I said he is the leader of world leader of this generation. What? Come to my office tomorrow, tomorrow morning, first thing. Come to her office. She says to me, he's off the chart and in two opposite characteristics. On the one hand, he, every little thing means so much to him. Every little thing, he doesn't play downplay the smallest thing that you could possibly imagine. And he never ever gets into a state of despair or despondency, giving up on himself. Yet his expectations are also off the chart. You can never satisfy him. It's impossible to satisfy him. Now that's not, no. if you can't be satisfied with who knows how much you accomplish, will small accomplishment mean something to you? If changing the whole world is not enough, one little thing will be. And if you are, have high expectations, you get depressed very quickly, right? Because you don't meet your expectations, you get very down on yourself. He's off the chart into, into both these two. Then here's the punchline, why I'm bringing the whole story down. Then she says, and you know what? He doesn't live on food. This is a non-religious woman. He does not live on food and drink. What gives him life is what his followers do or don't. When they listen to him, that gives him life. Food is just to prevent him from dying. But what gives him his life? What is he living with? He's living with faith. It says in Tanya, word for word. Faith and fear of God and what his followers do. That's what really gives him all the strength. So a Rebbe needs, the Rebbe needs his Hasidim. And he goes where, you know, the previous Rebbe writes in a mimer that you think you're, you can disconnect yourself wherever you go, wherever you go, it's a good place you slept the Rebbe, not just the Rebbe, all the Rebbe until the Baal Shem with you. And when you go, if you go to a place where you shouldn't be going, they're also there, forcefully. You can't get away from that. You're connected, like it or not. You came into yeshiva, you came into Mechayim Liyadus for one hour, for one day, certainly for one week or for one year, you're stuck. <laughs> life, finished. Stuck for life, in a good way. But you're connected to the Eitz HaChayim, as it's called. You're connected to the tree of life. And every movement, every, everything you do is so important. But not just, it's not just only people that are, are considered his followers. He connects and feels connection to every single Jew. And guess what? The non Jews as well. And the story of the Chinatown story, you know the Chinatown story? No. Senator Moynihan, you know, you heard of that name. Senator in New York, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, so he had personal problems, showing bias, you know, his wife, whatever, personal things that he discussed with all kinds of therapists and they to no avail. <laughs> So he decided, they heard a lot about the Rebbe, he came into the Rebbe for a different reason, he couldn't discuss it with the Rebbe. And the Rebbe gave him a very, I don't know what the answer was, but it was so simple and so straight and so practical, so down to earth. He heard the Rebbe is like a prophet, but he's so practical, he's so with it. And he like smiled, wow, he was wowing. As he was about to leave, the Rebbe said, now it's my turn to ask you for a favor. Okay, probably wants me to support the, you know, to help out the uh, Hasidim or whatever, some other Jews, and maybe you know, he's a world rabbi, so I'm sure he means. The, there are many people living in Chinatown who are having a difficulty. Can you do something to help them out? They can live a more, more uh, their finances should be better and they should have a more prosperous year. He almost faint when he heard that. They don't know him. Not one single China guy in Chinatown, Chinatown knows the Rebbe, and the Rebbe doesn't know any of them. Yet, the concern for all of humanity is just amazing. So while his obviously Israel was in a different level altogether, completely, but yet caring for every single human being in the world. Even the Arabs, that did not want loss of life for Arabs. He said, by making this peace plan will hurt the Jewish people, it will hurt Arabs too. Why a loss of life? But Rebbe had belief in every, even those that were, you know, even those, he believed that you could, except for Amalek, of course, exception. But the Rebbe didn't, the Rebbe had, the Rebbe was against family planning even for the Arabs as well. Talked about non-Jews, having children, don't make any plans, God's hand. That's quite amazing. A Rebbe, 
Think about a Rebbe caring about the non-Jewish people prospering, having a lot of children. Not, not normal. The whole world on his shoulders, literally, not just the Jewish world, the Jewish world too. And every little thing counts. I told you the story with my niece, with my niece, two and a half year old girl who forgot to light Shabbos candles, terrible, terrible tragedy. One Shabbos, the world's going to an end. She forgot to light the Shabbos candles. And the Rebbe wasn't answering questions about life and death, about, about emergency surgeries. It was a month of Elul, the Rebbe was busy. And Elul, the Rebbe was busy preparing, preparing for the new year. Nobody's getting answers. My, the, young, the father of this child, my brother-in-law, got an answer in within a half an hour. Tell her to add a penny of tzedakah the next Friday. She was by Ben Jizlicht. Wow. A penny of tzedakah will make a difference. The Rebbe took everything. He was stopped whatever he was doing. Having the whole cloud you throw on his head for that little girl. And the story with this 10-year-old boy, I remember his name is Isser Karik classmate of mine. So his father went to be Yechidis, and the Rebbe asked his father, what happened to your son's eyes? Nothing. How come on Rosh Hashanah, I noticed when I was, after I blew Shreifer, there were 10,000 people in the shul there, literally. And Rosh Hashanah is a pretty serious day, you know, after blowing Shreifer. The Rebbe blew Shreifer, he turns around, that's a complete 360. When I was turning around, I noticed that your son, you know, didn't have any, any glasses on. Simchas Torah, three weeks later, another 10,000 people in the room. I walked by and I noticed that he was wearing glasses. Why? Now, wearing glasses is not like, you know, uh, not like a serious ill. Another story. <laughs> My nephew, who's famous now, is a famous shliach called Mendel Samuels in uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. He's well-known and most wanted speaker. Also a comedian, by the way, so he's an entertainer. When he was a kid, a 14-year-old kid, he had uh, an ingrown toenail. The doctor scared the daylights out of him. We well, have to remove your nail. He thought that's life and death. He was scared. He told my father, his, aide, his grandfather, right into the rabbit, right into it. I'm not, I'm not taking this operation until the rabbit, until the rabbit gives me the okay. My father was reluctant. That's the quote of my groaner, you know, to tell him. My father, but he, got, he couldn't, couldn't resist because he was pressuring him. I won't take the operation. And he needed it. My father calls Rabbi Groner and says, um, um, you know, I might, um, yeah, yeah, if you call, yeah, my father and I hardly have a call. You call him, what, what's his? Uh, my nanny called my, in English, my grandson has a ring brown toenail. So it's quiet on the other side, it's quiet. <laughs> Heard a little chuckle also. Can you give it into the Rebbe? My father's face was red. Groner's face, he couldn't see, but it's probably also, he put it on the bottom of the pile of letters. The Rebbe shouldn't have to take that thing first. So, you no, know, the Rebbe took, uh, got the pile of letters. The Rebbe looked to the bottom, took out the bottom, <laughs> took out the bottom, and told him he should have the operation. I think it'll be okay. Here's a Rebbe thinking about an ingrown toenail, a little 14 year old fifth week. So there are a lot of stories, we can go on and on and on forever, but this is a Rebbe. A Rebbe is not just one who has a whole world on his shoulders, or he just has a few individuals that he cares about. Two opposites. My brother wrote a whole book called 68 Paradoxes of Our Rebbe. This is one of them. So many different ones. You can go on and on and on. Next week, I'll share some other paradoxes that are, are not much mind boggling that uh, we can share about the Rebbe. Let's give you a few more stories. Well, but for now, we'll go a little further. Oh, stop. Okay. Why is it Michael gain from us? He's the head, we're the leg, we're the foot. And the head, the foot can't walk. I mean, the head can't walk. Feet walk, but heads don't walk. The head tells the feet, the feet where to go. It tells the whole body what to do, but it tells the feet, which is the bottom part of the body, where to go. And the head receives its shlemus, its perfection, it, it's enhanced when the foot goes where the head wants it to go or it goes where it shouldn't be going. It follows the dictates of the brain that this is dangerous, don't go here, go here better. We are the feet. Simple Jews are like feet, feet. Just accept, don't have any thoughts of their own. The head, brain of the Jewish people is, the, is, a, is a, a Rebbe, leader of the generation. And just as a foot enhances the head, without the feet, the head can do what it wants, so too is with Maitre Rabbeinu. Now, what, is, what exactly happens, we'll see here, it's 
what the reminder says here is quite fascinating. The Moshe of Yisrael him took mas reish for Rajon. Moshe and the Jewish people are compared to a head and foot. As the verse says, Moshe Kosov, in Parshish Baal you also have, over here, you have, you want to pass it. I don't have the English of that passage. The Jews were complaining they have no meat, have none to eat, as usual. And Moshe says, 600,000 foot of people. What, what's foot doing there? 600,000 people. There were 600,000 Jews in the age of 20 to 60, men. Why is he saying, 600,000 feet? Why is he referring to us as feet? So it's clear that Moshe was referring to simple Jews that are considered to be like his feet. And then he says, Asher Bekirba, which I am in the, in their midst. I, Moshe, find myself in the midst of such people. Says the Mimer, a whole different shot over here. The Chol Yisrael de Moshe. Yes, we see from here, from the superfluous word of Ragle Ha'om, that yes, indeed, the Jewish people are called the feet of Moshe. O Moshe who are Rachel him, and Moshe is their head. That we can easily see. Just like any person. The feet lead, deliver the head, the mocking to a place. Where the head on its own accord cannot arrive there. But just as that is true in a human body, who will make of Israel so too is the case with most of the Jewish people. Shall you dare Yisrael through the Jews, the Haraglayim de Moshe, the feet of Moshe, so to speak? Mitvaseh Eloi Moshe. Moshe is enhanced. Moshe's power is magnified and enhanced. In what way? Zeh Moshe Kosto. Here we have a new meaning in the words. It says here, six hundred thousand people, Asher Anoichi, which I, Moshe, are in its midst. No, that's a simple meaning. The homiletical and Hasidic meaning is like this through the feet that they have done what I want them to do, following my dictates, I now have anoichi, which means not I, it means God's eye. The anoichi Hashem Lekecha now is in the midst of Moshe. Asher, through all this, through the feet of Moshe, through the feet, people that are called feet, his chassidim, his followers, anoichi, the God, the essence of God, the I, the capital I of God, is Bikir boy is now in the midst of Moshe. Moshe has now introduced himself to, in other words, a new element of godliness has now appeared in Moshe's Nishama, the Anoichi of God. What does that mean? Look into the footnote here. Look at footnote 20 on the bottom. He says, Moshe is on the level of Chachma. Moshe was the, uh, the epitomized, the Ability to comprehend, to understand godliness on a very special level. But a comprehender, a person who comprehends, a thinker, doesn't have, it's kind of difficult. Compare a great thinker to a simple person. When you ask a simple person, when you said God, what did you mean by God? You meant Elohim or you meant Havayim? What? When you said God, did you mean the Malik Halam or Saiba Halam? Did you mean God in the world, I meant God. I don't know what you're talking about. I only know one God. The simple person does have, has no appreciation of levels. And when a simple person says God, it means the most simplistic and straightforward aspect of God, which lends to no other meaning. Um, it's difficult for a great intellectual genius, as Moshe was, to be able to relate to the simplicity of God's essence because there's so much chachma there. There's so much chachma, it's hard to relate to the simple person's view of God. But through these Jews, the simple Jews, doing what, he, doing what Moshe wanted them to do, Moshe gained and had the advantage, the myla of the simplicity, of being able to see God on a very pure, pristine, organic level beyond all his chachma. So he says here, the, the anoichi, of, what's anoichi? Anoichi means I. But there's two words for, for I. Ani in Hebrew, Ani also means I. What's the extra chaf? Chaf stands for keser, crown. In fact, the word keser, um, the word chaf, the letter chaf is the gematria of the letter chaf is 20. How do you spell 
20. How do you say 20 in Hebrew? Esrim. What's Esrim? What's the gematria of the word Esrim? 620. The same gematria as Kesser. There are 620 mitzvahs. The Tronoichi is the beginning of these Ten Commandments, which include all the 613, including the seven rabbinical laws. So what he's saying here is as follows, that until Moshe had his chassidim do what he wanted and had the followers, Moshe was limited to Chachma. Through the feet of Moshe, through the followers of Moshe, Moshe reached a new level of awareness of God, the simplistic level of awareness. Um, which is beyond where Chokhmah can, can tap into. Chokhmah taps into God's profundity, how profound and the abstract Hashem is, and Moshe appreciated that. And he went from abstraction to abstraction to abstraction, going beyond and beyond and beyond ad infinitum. What about things that are not so abstract? What about Gashmias? Chokhmah doesn't like Gashmias. Chokhmah likes the more spiritual, the more gets gravitates towards that. Through the Jewish people's simplicity, Moshe was able to relate to a God that's not limited to profundity, to abstraction, but also how you can see God where he transcends all kinds of, of limits, including the limit of being profound. So anyways, in a nutshell, Moshe gains from us too. What time is it? Right, what? Well, let's finish this next paragraph. Through the feet of the people. The Gilui of the Anoichi, not Moshe's Anoichi, Hashem's Anoichi, was revealed in the midst of Moshe's Nisham. Now we understand what it means to give you the oil. What does oil stand for? Energy, fuel. That Moshe is energized after he connects the Jews to God. There's a reciprocation. The Jews reciprocate and give back Moshe fuel. Oil is fuel that Moshe himself was lacking until this. And the end of the Mimer, you'll see the fascination of what exactly we're giving Moshe more in detail. But here it says we're giving Moshe the oil. It wasn't just the oil for the Menorah, it was oil, spiritual oil, oil meaning energy that rises above all liquids. That you can't, that oil, extra power of oil is what, olive oil is what Moshe Rabbeinu received from the Jewish people through his connecting us to God. Through Moshe connecting and commanding and connecting the Jewish people with God, they will bring back to Moshe a new level of energy called Shemen Zayis. Sifu traces Urban Moshe will add a new level, new dimension of energy into Moshe Rabbeinu. Create a new light into Moshe that he didn't have before. And we'll soon see that this has to do with Mesiras Nepesh that we showed during the time of Golos. And there are two levels of Mesiras Nepesh and Golos. One is when things are going not good, and one is when things are going well. And this corresponds to the two Madregas of Yechido, which we'll talk about later on in the Mimer. Uh, next week is Thursday night, is a uh, fast day. Thursday, what's the time on Thursday? There won't be any class next week. So we're going to have to go a little faster. I know I spend a lot of time, I always do this. And I'm the one to fault. Spend a half an hour on our introduction and then told, told your story. So we ended up only learning two paragraphs. I was supposed to learn four, four, at least four paragraphs today, but only two. Yeah. And we only have five weeks, I think, because we have uh, skipping a week uh, next week. So I think only five weeks of the whole month. Try to finish the mime in five weeks. It's going to be a little hard to do that. Uh, but we'll try. Um, just one last thought I wanted to mention to you that there's a connection between the simple meaning of Tetzave, which means command, and the deeper meaning, which means to connect. And that is that the fact that Hashem commands you already shows that you mean something to Him. And an example given in Chassidus, you have a genius who's completely in a different world than a simple Jew, a simple person who just uh, only understands, you know, how to fix the toilet or something. And this Jew is non-existent in the life of the genius. But he's so thirsty and need to drink of water. And he asks this person, oh, by the way, can you just let me fetch me a glass of water? Suddenly, with that commandment, that person has now become a, connected to the great genius because he acknowledged your existence. And especially when you bring him a glass of water, you come even closer to him. So every commandment is a way how you connect to God too. Um, 
the next part of the mind is going to talk about what we spoke about earlier about Raya Mehemda, the faithful shepherd. And I'm going to see that there's two meanings in faith. In, there's three meanings now. You can trust he's a faithful shepherd, a shepherd of faith, which means he feeds us with faith, but not just feeds us. Because not all food is healthy. He nourishes us with nutrients. He feeds us in a nourishing way. But that's not just that. He doesn't only feed us with faith. Before he feeds us with faith, he feeds the faith. Moshe gives faith a new dimension of strength before he can take the faith that he's already strengthened and give it to us. So not feeding us with faith, feeding the faith itself. What does that mean, feeding faith itself? Well, that's based on the two reasons why we have faith. One is based on my neshama saw had a visual connection with God. That's the chaya, the mazel of the neshama, called mazel. Know why it's called mazel? Why is it called mazel? Why is it called mazel? Huh? Why, why the word mazel? The mazel means source of a flow, source of fluid, drip drops. Yeah. You know, going about your business, all of a sudden you get this drip of fear. You don't really know where it's coming from. So, but that's not the, that's, that's not the essence of the soul. That's the soul that's hovering over us and throws in us subconsciously feelings and doesn't last very long. It's very superficial. But then there's another level of our neshama, which is even more removed, seemingly, called the essence of our neshama, that has a much more permeating effect, even though it's further away, seemingly, a much more permeating effect on every part of our life. And when that's tampered with and dealt with, everything changes. And that's what all the Rebbe's do. Behind the scenes, they throw in Yechida, in the Chaya. They throw in some extra ingredient in the Amuna that you already have. I'm going to talk about that next week. There's a lot to talk about. I know the mind you might have learned, but there's so much to talk about here. I'll tell you some stories. Also, I'll waste some more time next week or two weeks from now. Have a wonderful job. Let's give you some time. Oh, one last thing. Okay. The Peter Rebbe said, made an announcement. Going out of business. Guys, Chitful Mesiras Nefesh. Grab Mesiras Nefesh before you're going to speak about it. You're not going to be able to have Mesiras Nefesh. You're not going to be able to have self-sacrifice anymore. 